All right, so uh, here is my second lecture. I had to do a bit of cleaning, uh, so I apologize for the delay. Right, so um, the last thing I talked about in classical theory was how to um, compute uh, or how to define Euler Lagrange derivative in this setting. So uh, let me start with recalling that. So Euler Lagrange derivative. Okay, and this was, was a little typo there, so it should be dl of phi in the direction of psi was defined as l of f first derivative at phi, but I was missing in the notes, so please correct that, where f is identically one on support of psi. And it's useful to actually try to look at an example of this. So let's consider a simple example. The free scalar field. Again, I might have given it with the wrong sign, so this is now probably correct. Uh, D mu phi, D mu phi plus m squared phi squared and times f and times some volume form, say, epsilon. So that's the Lagrangian for the free scalar field. And now we want to compute the derivative according to this definition. So first of all, uh, I recall what uh, the definition of the derivative. So in this, in the direction of at phi, in the direction of psi was defined as the limit uh, t going to zero, one over t of L of f at phi plus psi minus L of f of phi. So that's uh, the difference quotient definition. And well, first of all, we didn't have to compute uh, this shift and then see what comes out. So it's been a while since you computed the derivative from the definition, but okay, one has to do it sometime. Hello? Phi plus t psi, yes, because otherwise it would be silly. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so, you know, because it's been a while since I computed the derivative of the definition. Uh, okay, so this is easy. This is quadratic thing. So there is the first term where we don't uh, change anything. So it's just my term. Okay, then there is the term where we have the same with size. So d mu psi, d mu psi plus m squared psi. And there are the mixed terms and I can gather them together. This is symmetric. So minus two d mu pi d mu psi plus two m squared psi times phi and everything multiplying f and epsilon. Now, let's look at this definition, f equals one on support of epsilon. So if you now compare it with this formula, right? So uh, the only term which doesn't have a psi in it is this one, but okay. When we compute the derivative, we have to subtract this anyway, so let's continue here. So we have then the limit t going to zero, sorry, not infinity, oh my God, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. That's, uh, that again would be <laughs> quite trivial. Okay. Um, T going to zero, one over T. And then uh, this is just uh, L of F of phi. So that drops out. So we have then two terms. So that is, uh, let's write the mixed term first. So minus D mu um, phi D mu psi plus m squared pi times psi, and then uh, the quadratic term, so minus one half d mu psi d mu psi plus m squared half psi squared, sorry. Okay, it's probably correct now, times f times epsilon. And now, because all the terms contain at least one factor of psi, um, oh yeah, and I should also have the t's, so that's t, maybe I should use another color, uh, yeah, so this is what I forgot, so that's t, that's t squared, t squared, t, t, and here, I t plus uh, t t squared, and here I have t squared. Okay, I can now set f equals to one. So this is equal to one because this whole expression is only non-vanishing on the support of psi. Uh, and then what I really care about is uh, terms linear in T because quadratic in T would then uh, give zero as T goes to zero. So I'm only interested really in this part. So I can conclude. that dl of phi for that Lagrangian is, oh, sorry, dl of phi in the direction of psi is uh, just this first term. So minus d mu phi d mu psi plus m squared phi times psi times epsilon. So you see that f disappeared in the process of this calculation because it's equal to one on the support of psi. So that was the first thing to demonstrate. And now, okay, another thing I can do is to uh, use integration by parts so is compactly supported, so I can do so without problems to bring over this derivative from psi to phi, okay? So, and I have this sign here for a reason. So I bring over the derivative, so I have now box on phi plus m squared phi times psi times epsilon. So this looks more like what you are used to as uh, you know, computing Ole Lagrange derivative. So this you can now recognize as standard equation of motion. So this is just box plus m squared on pi. So this is plain Gordon operator. Okay, and this generalizes, so if you want to make a connection with sort of standard um, computations, uh, so note that in general, if we have higher derivatives, so if we have for, uh, 
f of the form um, some function alpha of the finite jet times epsilon. So this is a generic form of a local functional. We have now, well, you can easily see how this formula for the derivative uh, generalizes. So the first derivative of f at phi in the direction of psi can be written as uh, now you have uh, you have to take into account all the derivatives. So say um, well you have some uh, yeah, maybe let's just write it by hand. So there is d alpha over d phi of x. So this is the dependence on the fields themselves times uh, psi of x. Then you have, um, this would be this term with the derivatives where you have to differentiate Sorry, we have to integrate by parts once. So then you have d mu d alpha over d. Uh, and now you have the derivative of the field of x. Okay. And then you continue until you run out of derivatives. You're always at the finite jet situation. So this sum is finite. And everything is multiplied by psi of x epsilon of uh, oh actually uh, yeah right epsilon of x you just have to make sure that uh, you're using the same uh, co covariant derivative which is compatible with the volume form so here uh, so that the integration by parts works the way we want it. Let's put um, the volume form associated with the metric. So, uh, yeah, let's put d mu g. That's the volume form. Volume form from the metric. So then you can uh, uh, safely integrate by parts using the covariant derivatives. Okay. Very good. So uh, this is just to connect to uh, the standard formulation and you can uh, denote this whole thing uh, denoted usually by D alpha of X. So this is the variation of derivative. Okay, so that's more or less all you need uh, in classical theory. Uh, the end product of that whole exercise is to get uh, the field equations. So that's also something I said last time. So field equations and these are d L of phi equals zero. So the space of solutions so I denoted as ES, and uh, we are interested in observables uh, which are functionals on the solution space. So, functionals on the solution space. So, this I denote by. F, S, and one way to see them 
is as a quotient of all functionals modular those that vanish on the solution space. So F0 is functionals that vanish on the solution space. Okay, and there is a bit of physics nomenclature. So if I'm talking about uh, functionals on the solution space, I'm saying that I work on shell. So if you work on the solution space, this is on shell. So this whole guy you can say is on shell. But if I refrain from taking that quotient, so if I just work on F, this is called off shell. Okay, so if I forget myself and sometimes say, okay, I work off shell, it means that uh, I'm not taking this quotient. Um, and this is quite important later on because things like time ordered products, which I care about, are only defined off shell. So one has to refrain from taking that quotient until the very end. Uh, another remark, maybe in the relation to uh, one of the afternoon talks yesterday, uh, what we do in practice, we don't actually take that quotient, we take a sort of derived version of that quotient. So uh, in practice, so we work with um, Kazoo Tate resolution. resolution of that quotient. Okay, so that's derived. I'm probably not going to get to this, but in case I have some time left at, at the end of uh, this, the last lecture on Friday, can maybe say something about it because it's relevant for gauge theories and I don't want to leave you with the impression that the only thing I can do is the scalar field. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm better than that. Um, but yeah, it's the whole, whole new uh, formalism to talk about it. Okay, so for now we work off shell. Uh, F for us is the space of multi-local functionals. So F multi-local functionals on the space of uh, fields. And, uh, okay, so let's start with uh, maybe introducing some dynamics. So one way obviously to take into account the dynamics is by taking that quotient, but I don't want to do that. I want to encode all the dynamics only in algebraic structures that I put on the space F. So the first thing that we do in classical theory, well, we have an algebra, we introduce a Poisson bracket. So classical theories are Poisson algebras or even symplectic algebras. So I'm going to work towards defining that Poisson bracket. Okay, so there are a few steps. So the first step is to linearize uh, the equations of motion. So here, that equation as an equation of phi doesn't have to be linear. It's linear in the case of the free field, but in general it's not. So the first step is to linearize uh, the equations of motion. And this is uh, obtained by taking the second derivative of my Lagrangian. And by definition, this is going to be a distribution. So second exterior tensor power of our, our vector bundle over m squared. So this is a distributional kernel, which we obtain from this second derivative. Um, but now we can also uh, 
example, we have a kernel, we can use Schwarz kernel theorem, so we can uh, define an operator. So this is induces an operator, a linear operator. Okay, everything's local, so this is going to be a differential operator. So in the first instance, okay, so we had things uh, in the second dual, well, second tensor power of the dual of E, so the operator is going to go uh, from E to E prime, and uh, because it actually happens to be uh, a differential operator, it, uh, its image is going to be smooth, so in fact, we have uh, a differential operator which I denote by uh, P pi because, sorry, let's do it at the point. Forgot the point. So P phi, which goes from E to E dual. Okay. And here, uh, well, I dropped the compact support in the image because I'm setting f equals to one. So I really have an operator going from E to E dual. Uh, okay, and in favorable circumstances, E dual can also be uh, identified with E if I happen to have uh, a nice, nice pairing, so in particular for the scalar field, um, that's straightforward. Okay, so here the example we looked at for the free scalar field, uh, the derivative at each point would give the same operator, namely the Van Gordon operator. So for example, free scalar field, so E phi, uh, give it a different name, so E phi zero at phi would be just this operator. So it's constant, it's everywhere the same because the theory is quadratic. So, constant. Okay. Uh, in phi zero. But we are not interested in free scalar field only. So in general, uh, at each point phi, we might have a different operator. Uh, the only thing I want to assume about it is that this operator is particularly nice as a differential operator. Uh, and in particular, I want this to be not too far off from this um, D'Alembertian, not too far off from being a wave operator. So the running assumption, so P I zero is a normally hyperbolic, operator for all phi zero in E. So normally hyperbolic, it means that principal symbol is given by the metric. So the principal symbol is essentially the principal symbol of the box. So uh, principal symbol given by the metric. So these are good, and the reason why they're good 
is that they have particularly nice green functions. So for such operators, there exist unique retarded and advanced greens functions okay which i denote by a uh, delta r delta a so what does it mean to be retarded and advanced well it's about uh, the way they propagate the initial data either to the future or to the past. So being retarded, um, sorry, uh, means that if you have the support of some uh, test function and you apply delta R to it, then the support is propagated to the future. Whereas with the other guy, the support is propagated to the past. So that would be delta advanced on F. And obviously, they are both green functions. So um, P composed with both of them. Uh, oops. Uh, let's see, maybe I should say that uh, the domain of definition of those is actually only uh, compactly supported configurations. So let me write this down properly. So they go from compactly supported things in the dual to E. So you can see that the operator P went from E to E dual, uh, but these inverses are only defined on the compact, compactly supported ones. So this is an identity on compactly supported configurations. And the other thing also goes, but again, you have to restrict to compactly supported configurations. So this is also identity. I will send this up so you can see it better. Okay, so here are the gadgets we get from uh, PDEs, from hyperbolic PDEs. I'm going to use them to construct my uh, first Poisson structure and then some lovely propagators for the quantization. Yes. Right. Uh, this is uh, this one, right? Why is it not? So, so the, the operator goes from E to E dual. So the green function has to go from uh, E dual to E. Right, okay, maybe I should. Well, no, that's good. So let's see. Uh, so the green function goes from uh, E dual to E. The operator goes from E to E dual. So I'm back in E dual. Oh, yes, yes, oh yeah, sorry. Oh, that's silly, thank you. Yes, yes, that, that's not symmetric, thank you. I figured out the first one. Uh, right. So, then uh, compactly supported, compactly supported in the dual, and then, yeah. Yes. Okay, then it's good. And P is a local operator, so it preserves compact support. So, if I 
end up in something compactly supported, then, so if I restrict this to compactly supported, then the image of P is also compactly supported. So I can feed, feed this into these things. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, are there any more questions? This is a good time to ask questions. No, there's still no way we can let other people ask questions, I guess. The, the other rooms, no, okay. Um, I will uh, proceed with uh, cleaning the board. Okay. All right, so back to the pot. I said I'm going to use these retarded and advanced things to define a Poisson structure. So first, I define something which I called pauli oden function. I wasn't clean enough. Pauli Jordan function. So again, these things uh, are defined at the point. So let's remember that. So delta at the point is the retarded minus the advanced propagator at that point. And uh, well, again, I can think of it as a map or I can think of it as an integral kernel. So and think of it as an integral kernel in, again, uh, now it's on the dual over n2. And uh, again, uh, another way to think about it 
is uh, the assignment of this integral kernel to phi is something like a bivector on E. So note, so this assignment uh, is, uh, morally speaking, a bivector on E modulo some completions. Completions. All right, which I don't want to talk about because it's nasty. Uh, but having a Poisson bivector, I can now define a Poisson structure. So we define a, uh, ah, I didn't say this is Poisson bivector, of course, uh, and I'm not going to prove it. I will give you some references. So fact, So delta is a Poisson by vector. So you have to check it's anti-symmetric and satisfies Jacobi. Uh, and I will send you to, there's a, a diploma thesis uh, that was written in Hamburg under supervision of Klaus Rehnhagen by uh, Jacobs. So very fitting with the Jacobi identity. So this is Jacobs Eichbrücken in Klassischen Feldtheorie. So this is where you can find the details. And I can now define the bracket finally. Sorry, classical theory always takes time. So Poisson bracket. So for two functionals f and G, so F and G, let's assume to be multi-local. Okay, I define the bracket by taking this delta and then contracting it with the F tensor D G. Okay, so this looks pretty harmless, but I have to think about whether it's well-defined or not. I hope it's well-defined, so let's see. Uh, so this kernel here is in um, the dual of tensor product of E, okay, to M squared. Now, uh, a nice fact is that multilocal functionals have smooth derivatives, plus derivative, so smooth plus derivative. So this one here is in, at each point, is in E uh, dual prime, sorry, is in E dual compactly supported, and this one is also in E dual compactly supported. Okay, their tensor product, exterior tensor product, would then um, be in compactly supported sections of this bundle, so it pairs with delta, which is in the dual of that. Sorry, there is a lot of duals, but uh, I mean, the thing is that this is actually arranged in such a way that uh, 
and the way we put it together is well defined, but it's a bit of a subtle thing because uh, secretly I'm multiplying distributions in that pairing and it's not always a good idea. Okay, uh, so I'm almost done with this classical theory now. The only thing I need to check is, well, so if I have two multilocal functionals, is their bracket also going to be a multilocal functional? The answer is not really. So this uh, delta is a bit more singular. So uh, this I know object I get here is a bit more singular than that. So I need to enlarge this space a bit so that I actually get an algebra, something which is closed under my bracket operation. So f is not closed. under the bracket, so I need to enlarge it. And this leads to uh, another concept which I'm introducing in the classical theory, but it's going to be uh, crucial in the quantum theory as well, which is that of Microcausal functionals. So, um, so I introduce microcausal functionals. F microcausal. Okay. Uh, pause for a thought. How much time do I have? When, when do I need to finish? Because we started late and then 17 minutes. Can I have 20 minutes? Okay, cool. <laughs> As one always has to bargain a bit. Uh, so, okay. Um, I'm not sure what's the background of the audience. So, uh, does everybody know what's a wavefront set? No? Yes? Enthusiasm, wavefront set? No, okay, <laughs> so maybe maybe I should uh, define it then. So, uh, because I will need this for, for that guy. So wavefront set. Uh, and well, first of all, this is something about distributions. This is about singularity structure of distributions. And uh, first of all, let me define it on Rn. So, uh, let uh, omega be open in R n and take uh, a distribution u in uh, d prime of omega. So compactly dual, uh, sorry, so distributions on omega, so dual of compactly supported functions on omega. Then the wavefront set. set WF of U is a complement so first of all the wavefront set is something that lives uh, in the uh, cotangent bundle but on Rn it doesn't really make a difference cotangent or tangent is the complement in omega cross r n minus zero. I want to take out the zero vectors of the set of points x k zero such that, and now uh, put it like this, there exists two things, a function f compactly supported with 
f of x equals 1. So it's a sort of a function which introduces uh, a bit of a cutoff. So I have a distribution, then uh, I multiply it with f, so I have something compactly supported around x because I only care about uh, singularity structure at s, x. So I do that. And this is the important bit. So the supremum of one plus modulus k to the n, the supremum goes over k's in some conical neighborhood of this k zero. So I look at the neighborhood of k zero. So this is k in C, uh, let's put it like this. So, uh, sorry, <laughs> don't have enough room here. Uh, so C is a conic neighborhood. Of, yeah, I should really make a better strategy for this one. So there is a function and a an open conic neighborhood of k zero with the following. So the supremum over k in C of one plus modulus k to the n times, so I take f times u to have something compactly supported, Fourier transform of k less than infinity for all n in n zero natural numbers. Okay, sorry, this is a very complicated definition. Let me break it down into more understandable pieces. So let's start from the end. So if I have a function such that uh, for all conical neighborhoods like that, uh, we have, uh, so this condition here, this is essentially, if that's true, then we say we have something rapidly decaying in uh, a given uh, conical neighborhood, okay? So uh, you see, here I'm saying that this Fourier transform uh, decays faster than any polynomial in K, right? So this is that condition. So this tells me that I have rapid decay. Uh, now, if I have a distribution such that Fourier transform is rapidly decaying everywhere, it means that uh, I actually have a smooth function. Okay, that's, that's a theorem. So here I'm measuring how singular is my distribution by a failure of rapid decay. So I can say there are some, maybe there are some directions in uh, the, um, well, basically that would be the momentum space, right? Let's call it momentum space because this is what we are going to talk about. So uh, if there are some directions in the momentum space where my uh, Fourier transform decays rapidly, then these would be non-singular directions. And the wave front set is the complement of these non-singular directions. So in the other <laughs> words, this is the set of singular directions. And what's interesting in Lorentzian signature, which is not the case in Euclidean, that there are some directions which are singular, but there are also some non-singular directions. So this causal structure introduces some extra layer of complexity to the singularity structure of distributions. So not everything is a delta. So delta has a wave front set which is maximal. Each direction is singular. But these guys over here, so this, uh, this capital delta, so the uh, Pauli-Yodan function, 
is singular only in certain directions. So I can use the fact that I have some room uh, to be able to multiply distributions and get away with it. So that was the excursion in the wavefront set. If this is the only thing you learn in this series of lectures, this is also great because wavefront sets are a nice tool in other areas of mathematics as well. So, uh, okay, so now let me say something about the wavefront set of that uh, delta. So the wavefront set of delta, okay, so we are on M2, so here you see uh, we, had, we, had, we had to have a pair of a point and the tangent or cotangent direction. So here we have then a point and a cotangent vector, and then we have to have another point and another cotangent vector. So this is in cotangent bundle without zero. So this, this notation means cotangent bundle without the zero vector. Uh, okay, such that. And here we have a relation x k is related to x prime k prime. And this relation, yeah, means that there exists a null geodesic strip. So this means a geodesic together with its tangent vectors such that both these things are on it, x, k, and x prime, k prime belong to it. it. Okay, so what are null, null geodesics? Well, there is, a, there is a, an obvious one in Minkowski, so, uh, on Minkowski space time, light cone is the space of null, null directions. So being a null geodesic in a curved space time is the generalization of being on the light cone. So uh, for example, in Minkowski space time, this means that singularities are on the light cone and uh, the singular directions are uh, related by parallel transporting along the light cone. So this is, this is a bit of uh, geometry to do. There are some nice results about uh, singularity structures of various um, propagators uh, in Lorentzian manifolds. So let me, do I have this reference here? I hope I do, uh, maybe not. Uh, yeah, sorry, I have to look for it later, but for more about it, there is a paper of Grazikowski. Where he analyzes uh, this sort of a thing, so you can find out more about it. Okay, so I can now define uh, the space of functionals whose derivatives can be multiplied by delta. So. Uh, such that their singularity structure is sort of complementary to um, that of delta. Uh, so now I'm going to use some uh, microlocal analysis, very little of that, unfortunately. Uh, so there, is, there are rules for multiplying distributions for multiplying distributions so 
So that you will find in the book of Hermander. volume one, uh, and you will find out that you can multiply uh, distributions as long as their wavefront sets don't add up to zero at any point. So if you think you cannot multiply distributions, you are wrong, you can do this, but you have to be careful. And here we are in the situation where uh, we can just be careful and get away with it. Okay. Last definition, and then uh, I'm, I'm done. So let me just uh, use this whole uh, machinery to define what I mean by microcausal functionals. So definition F is microcausal. If it is compactly supported, I'm always assuming that, and there is a condition for the singularity structure of its derivatives. So the wavefront set of each derivative has to be contained in some cone, which I'm going to define right now for all D E. And the cone is a complement in the cotangent space of, so here we are have distributions on Mn because of n here. So x1 to xn point and then cotangent vectors k1 to kn. Okay, and this has to be contained in uh, so let me use this notation. So a uh, closed forward light cone, some closed past light cone at the point. Again, the notation is a bit cryptic, so apologies for that. This is closure for, yeah, maybe inside inside of the future light cone and this is inside uh, uh, yeah so it's inside in the closure so inside the, maybe the closure of And this is the same, but this is the past light cone. And I want to say, maybe that's not entirely clear. Uh, so at each point, I want to uh, draw a light cone in the cotangent space and then take the light cone together with its interior. So that's V plus at X and uh, V minus at X would be this, V minus at X. So microcausal functionals are those guys who have singularities that are outside uh, the light cone. So this is the light cone and then the singular directions are allowed to be, sorry, only uh, in the complement of that. So our delta had singularities on the light cone. If we 
uh, take some powers and we might have to add them, but they will still be contained inside. So if we want to avoid hitting those singular directions, we have to be um, safely outside both the future and past life. Okay, sorry for going over time, uh, but yeah, so this is it for now and I will continue after lunch. Thank you. Uh, just the, the light cone uh, inside uh, m to the power of n, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, right. So, so you can see there is like, uh, yeah, I, I, I drew the sort of one, one dimensional version of that, but you have to imagine the light cone inside, yeah, on mn. Mm -hmm. They don't have many dimensions there. Thank you, and I, I promise to quantize it after lunch. <laughs>